This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hello and welcome or welcome back to Self Work. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist and I've lived and worked in Fayetteville, Arkansas for over 30 years. And I'm so glad you're here. We started Self Work eight years ago now to extend the walls of my practice to those of you who might already be extremely interested in psychological issues. Maybe you're in therapy, maybe you're looking for answers yourself, or you're in a third group that maybe, just maybe, you are pretty darn skeptical about the whole mental health world and think people are just blaming their parents for everything and you wouldn't walk in the door of a therapist. Well, I'm a therapist. So if this makes sense to you and you kind of need to listen to it, then maybe, just maybe, you'll change your mind. Don't know hope so. One of the reasons why many people suffer during the so-called holiday season is because it's the first or one of many holidays that they've actively grieved a loved one's death within the last year or even maybe further away, and they cannot seem to work through their grief enough to want to step back into life, into living this moment that's right before them. I have a very good friend who's doing just that, trying to find her way. She's doing a really good job, but I thought about her for today's episode. So when I tuned into one of my favorite podcasts, Hidden Brain, and heard them discussing how to cope with living after a devastating loss, I listened. And I learned a recently researched concept of grief that I'd not heard of before. And of course, it happened to match what I've seen and experienced with patients for years. So it's always nice to have research find results that match what you're already thinking and talking about and suggesting in therapy. And this was one of those times. But I wanted to pass these ideas on to you, as you might be one of those people who are struggling with grief and not knowing how to get out from under its shadow, or maybe even feeling that you shouldn't or don't want to or just damn confused and lost about the whole thing. The pain you feel is deeper than any you may have felt in the past, and all you can see is it, your grief, your emptiness, your what-if questions. I'll have the Hidden Brain episode in the show notes so you can listen to yourself to resilience researcher Lucy Hone's personal story of the horrific death of her 12-year-old daughter. It was ironic that she at the same time was a resilience researcher and then found herself living through the nightmare of a child's death. Some of you who've been listeners for a while may remember my own grief comes in waves description, but today we'll talk about what can be confusing about what's out there about how you're supposed to grieve and focus on what's emerging as a much more unique view of what grieving can look like. Our listener voicemail is from a listener who says he's been diagnosed with what's called schizoaffective disorder and wonders if I know much about it or can help him with intrusive thoughts that he can't seem to rid himself of. Right now, we want to turn to AG1 as one of our very special sponsors. I gave packets of AG1 last year and everyone's stocking. We had a crowd last year of 20-somethings that hike and backpack and trek and snowboard, and they loved it. You might want to think of the active folks in your life who really care about the quality of the supplements they take and their effectiveness. And you can get them in travel packs. It's a handy stocking stuffer. Our next partner is AG1, the daily foundational nutrition supplement that supports whole body health. I drink it literally every day. I gave AG1 a try because I wanted a single solution that supports my entire body and covers my nutritional bases every day. I wanted better gut health, a boost in energy, immune system support. I take it in the morning before starting my day and I make sure and leave it out for my husband because he tends to forget. I love knowing that I'm starting my day so incredibly well, and I wouldn't change a thing because it's really helped me the last two or three years I've taken it. And here's a fact. Since 2010, they've improved their formula 52 times in the pursuit of making this nutrition supplement possible and the best it can be. So if you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash selfwork, and that's a new link, 
drinkag1.com slash selfwork. Check it out. Lucy Hone had planned a family trip with a friend. In fact, the friend was the mother of her daughter's best friend, and of course, the daughter herself, and thought nothing of it when her daughter asked if she could make the trip with them instead of riding in the family car. Nor did she think much about it when they didn't arrive when they were supposed to, thinking, you know, they got caught up in traffic or some such normal travel headache. It wasn't until her husband's cell phone rang and he got a look in his eyes she'd never seen that her world as she knew it stopped. She identified her daughter by the shoes she had on the morning when they all said goodbye. She and her friend and the mom driving had died in a terrible wreck, not 20 minutes away from where Lucy and the rest of her family were sitting down to dinner. So now, Lucy Hone, resilience researcher, found herself in the darkest despair of her life. In this stunning interview on Hidden Brain, she describes the day she suddenly realized, I have to choose life, and slowly began to study herself as she might a research participant on what her steps were to grieve and live with that grief and the process that allowed her to do that over the years. Then she decided to do further research on a grief model written about the research team of Strobe and Shoot a model that differed from many of them out there at the time. Strobe and Shoot first wrote about this theory in 1999. I'll read a little from that scientific research abstract, but not too much. It's real jargonistic. So here you go. This model identifies two types of stressors, loss and restoration-oriented, and a dynamic regulatory coping process of oscillation, whereby the grieving individual at times confronts, at other times avoids, the different tasks of grieving. This model proposes that adaptive coping is composed of confrontation and avoidance of loss and restoration stressors. It also argues the need for dosage of grieving, that is, the need to take respite from dealing with either of these stressors as an integral part of adaptive coping. Okay, so enough of the scientific mumbo-jumbo. So what was so different about this? Basically, the models of grief before had either been the very first one, which Freud designed, called grief work, which had said that months must be spent going over the details of the relationship with a loved one. But as much as Freud was on target about some things, he was wrong about a lot of other things, and this was one of them. Then the same guy that created attachment theory, Bowlby, came up with his own model, which said there were stages of grief. The mourner must go through four of them, in fact. Initial numbness, disbelief, or shock then yearning or searching for the lost person, accompanied by anger and protest. The third was despair and disorganization as the bereaved gives up the search, accompanied by feelings of depression and lethargy. And then number four, reorganization or recovery as the loss is accepted and an active life is resumed. So, Bowlby was the first one to talk about anger, which is so important. And he was much more optimistic about working through it in general. Then came Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. And I spent another episode talking about how her stages were not stages of the mourner, but stages of the person dying. And they were a neat five-pack of understandable stages. In fact, I'll have that episode in the show notes for you if you want to review it. Those stages were denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And then somehow, these came to be the Bible or the Torah or whatever your particular belief is about the pinnacle of wisdom. That's what grief was supposed to be, to the point that if you weren't grieving properly following Kubler-Ross's model, you were doing grief wrong. Well, all of that is ridiculous. Lucy Hone knew it was ridiculous. And that was certainly not what she needed facing this horrible, nightmarish loss. And remember, she's a resilience researcher, so that's the lens through which she was looking. In 2017, she wrote a book about what she'd experienced called Resilient Grieving, How to Find Your Way Through Devastating Loss. And I'll have that book in your show notes. 
So, let's go over all these without the mumbo-jumbo and figure out what it means. Let's hear this description of this, what I'll call a restoration model, again. This model identifies two types of stressors, loss and restoration oriented, and a dynamic regulatory coping process of oscillation, whereby the grieving individual at times confronts and at other times avoids the different tasks of grieving. Okay, let's just take that apart. Basically, oscillation is a regular movement back and forth. I sleep with an oscillating fan every night of my life. It moves back and forth. Some of them move up and down as it blows air. So that's what they're saying is helpful. Moving back and forth between going toward your grief, digging into it, crying, being angry, dealing with belongings, and avoiding those things, taking a break. Not forgetting, but not pushing yourself towards something that will be hard. Restoration. Here's the second part. Again, kind of mumbo jumbo It also argues the need for dosage of grieving. That is, the need to take respite from dealing with either of these stressors as an integral part of adaptive coping. So, what this says is that your mind and your heart and your soul has to find some place to restore itself, to find some kind of peace, no matter how small. That grief needs to be parceled out in doses, or you'll get lost in it. This adds a different meaning or facet to my own analogy for grief, that it's like waves going in and out, that some days the waves will be stronger, some weaker, and then some rogue wave will come along and take your breath away, but that that rise and fall is natural. What this model adds is that not only is that the way grief naturally is, but that it's necessary for it to be that way, for you to restore some sense of resilience. Now that makes sense to me. I'm sure, or relatively sure, that all of us know someone or of someone that died along with their spouse, or their mother, or their child. I've heard many stories of a parent dying early in a child's life, and the other parent just quit living. At least they weren't parenting. They basically died to the child as well, and that child was left to fend for themselves. Or there are others who never got over a divorce. When they talk about it, you think it happened last year, and then you find out it was 10 years ago. That's certainly not resilience. I'm not downing them for it. I'm not saying that's horrible. I'm just saying it's not resilience. It's a lack of skill to handle what I quite realize might be the worst tragedy of their life. So, let's get back to you. What I hear from so many people is that taking that break or trying to distract from grief, if you find yourself laughing, for example, you feel guilty, especially if it's at a funeral or too soon for you to do that, that all of that feels like something is very wrong. This has always concerned me. And now we have a way of understanding it. It's healthy to find some time away, even if it's a few minutes. You're not abandoning your loved one. Your mind is taking a tiny little break from the grief. It's trying to find some way to begin to restore what feels normal, what feels livable. I worked with a gentleman, and I use that term because he was just that, a gentleman, during the pandemic. We'll call him Jerry. Jerry was older and hadn't used Zoom before, so he had a bit of a time with that at first, but became quite comfortable with it. Jerry's wife, Martha, had died around six months before, maybe eight. She'd had dementia, so they'd followed a pattern every day, which had helped her. At certain times every day, they'd eat, or then they'd sit out and watch neighbor's kids come home from school. All the kids and parents knew their names because Martha had made really good cookies, which Jerry still tried to make, and the passers-by would wave at them as they went by, maybe come up to the porch if a cookie was offered. Martha and Jerry had been each other's love of their lives, and he was quite lost without her, understandably. But Jerry was dying along with her, and he knew it. He had a son that could see it too, and he asked his dad to have sessions with me. Jerry balked, but then his son said he'd seen me years before, 
And I wasn't that weird type of therapist that you'd see in movies. <laughs> and that he'd pay for it if Jerry would go. It turned out Jerry and I worked well together. He'd rock in his chair as we talked. And he told me all about Martha. He'd tear up, never a whole lot. He showed me pictures and read me things she'd written to him, talked to me about their history and their stories. I asked him to start writing to Martha, to tell her what he'd done that day. The first time, his letter was really short, because he'd done very little. But the more he wrote, the more he could see that he was living as if she were still in his care. And he wasn't getting out and doing what he'd enjoyed to do before her disease took hold. The more we worked, the more he grieved and then took a break. He'd play games with neighbors or fix something he loved to eat. Then finally, he took a trip to see his son and his grandchildren, which he'd initially said he couldn't do, not without Martha. We only met around eight times. Jerry grieved and Jerry restored his life. Jerry found his resilience sitting right beside his sadness. Your grief is unique to you. Your timetable will be yours. It may be different than the rest of your family or your spouse or your siblings, and that's okay. The only thing I'd watch out for, the sign that I think there's a problem with grief and finding resilience, is when you get stuck. You get stuck in anger. You get stuck in despair. You get stuck and won't move a thing that was theirs or months, if not years, after their death. You're paralyzed. And you might not be dying, but you're drowning in whatever emotion or lack of emotion that is filling you up or emptying you out. That's when you need professional help. That's another way of dying along with the deceased. And they'd never, never want that if they truly loved you. So, grieve. Journal, laugh, take time away, talk with friends who you can talk honestly with, grieve more, go to therapy if you need it, let the waves go in and out, know that's natural and normal, and take the holiday season with a grain of salt. No shoulds, no musts, no have tos. Speak pipe message from Dr. Margaret Rutherford.com. The listener voicemail today is from someone who's suffering from thoughts he can't get away from, and he's been diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder. Let's hear from him. Do you uh, work with or, or is your work relevant to schizoaffectives who are currently suffering from overwhelming amounts of thoughts, uh, admiring thoughts? things they can't get away from their past and so on and so forth. I have an effective regimen of medication, but like I said, I'm just having trouble with overwhelming thoughts that I can't seem to dismiss, get away from. Thank you. First, let's talk about what schizoaffective disorder is, or maybe we should start with what schizophrenia is. Schizophrenia is a mental disorder characterized by continuous or relapsing episodes of psychosis. And psychosis means you hear things or you see things that are not here or you have very disorganized thinking. You have delusions, perhaps, which are beliefs that you believe are true and simply aren't. Other symptoms can include social withdrawal and apathy. Its usual onset is anywhere from 18 to 25 and currently there is not a cure. But let's be quick to point out that schizophrenia is on a spectrum like most other mental illnesses. So there are people who are much more high-functioning than those who struggle more. It certainly does not mean that this person has a low IQ. That's simply not true. Although their ability to reason can be impacted because of the thinking problems. Now, what I learned in grad school was that schizoaffective disorder meant that these symptoms tended to appear when the person was more emotionally stressed. So again, there might be this mixture of psychosis or again, these hallucinations, either visual or auditory, you're hearing or seeing things or your thinking's real disorganized or you're having delusions when you're really depressed or you're manic, something like that. So what I learned was that these psychotic symptoms might not be present unless the affective symptoms were present as well. Now, 
Actually, schizoaffective disorder disappeared as a diagnosis for a while, why I don't know, but it has reappeared in the official diagnostic manual. So, I got this from the Mayo website. Signs and symptoms of schizoaffective disorder depend on the type, bipolar or depressive type, may include delusions, having false fixed beliefs with evidence to the contrary, hallucinations such as hearing voices or seeing things that aren't there, impaired communication and speech such as being incoherent, bizarre or unusual behavior, symptoms of depression, periods of manic mood. And impaired functioning, problems with managing personal care, including cleanliness and physical appearance. Again, that's also very similar to schizophrenia, except they, in schizoaffective disorder, talk more about the depression and mania. Okay, so this listener says there are overwhelming thoughts that I can't seem to get away from. And he certainly sounds like his meds have him stable, but these thoughts about the past are intruding. He wanted to know if my own work had been in this field, and the answer is really no. Now, I've seen people who could become psychotic, especially if they got off their meds, but the people who saw me were fairly high-functioning. They held down jobs, had families, but it was a very difficult life for sure. The best treatments that I found when I researched were CBT, or Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, and DBT, which is a kind of special CBT, or Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, that's designed for people whose emotions run very high and can lead to impulsive or dramatic behavior. So, I think probably DBT, Dialectical Behavior Therapy, might be the therapy of choice. But again, it's kind of hard to tell from this man's message I think he should go to a mental health professional to help him work on any trauma in his history. That work would have to go carefully. I have someone in my practice now who can get psychotic, and we have to talk very carefully about trauma because she can become disorganized easily if she gets too upset. So someone with years of experience needs to help this listener and help him navigate whatever trauma work he may still need to do. Maybe that's what those intrusive thoughts are about. As always, thank you for leaving a message. I ask all of you to do the same. You can do that through the SpeakPipe app, which you can find in the show notes, or you can go to drmarketrutherford.com, and it's right there. It says, Record for Podcast. (laughs) And I'd love to hear from you. It's really easy to do. Again, drmarketrutherford.com. You can also subscribe there, and you can get a weekly newsletter from me today, or this week we included Thanksgiving pictures. It was a lot of fun to do as well as my blog post and regular podcast. So it's a very easy way to keep in touch with me and keep up with what's going on. Would love to be in touch with you every week. My TEDx talk has now reached over 360,000 views. I cannot believe it. If you haven't listened to it or watched it yet, it's at TEDx. All you have to do is put in TEDx and DrMargaretRutherford.com and it will get you right there. I'm very, very honored by this, and it's led to some wonderful opportunities that I'll tell you about in the coming months. And of course, Perfectly Hidden Depression is available wherever you buy books. A lot of people have been buying the audiobook recently, which is kind of fun. I guess since you're traveling, you want to listen to an audiobook, and mine is just as good as any. (laughs) So feel free, the ebook, the audiobook, or of course, the regular paperback. Again, thank you, as always for being here at Self Work. Please take very good care of yourself, your family, and your community in this time when there is so much strife and war and confusion. I'm Dr. Margaret, and this has been Self Work.